This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Evacuation efforts are underway in southern Ukraine after an explosion destroyed a critical dam on the Dnipro River in the Russian-occupied region of Kherson. Ukraine and Russia are blaming each other for the blast. Ukraine's government says floodwaters are threatening 80 towns and villages, as well as the city of Kherson, home to over 300,000 people. The breach could also limit drinking water supplies across Kherson and Crimea. The disaster has raised fears of a nuclear accident at Europe's largest nuclear power station, the six-reactor Zaporizhia plant, which is upstream from the dam. Russian officials say the water levels of a reservoir used to hold cooling water for the plant has already fallen by more than eight feet. The International Atomic Energy Agency said there is no, quote, immediate nuclear safety risk. Ukraine also says at least 150 tons of machine oil has been released into the Dnipro River. Ukraine's ambassador-at-large, Anton Korenovich, spoke earlier today at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Under the leadership of President Zelensky and with the courage of the armed forces of Ukraine, Russia cannot defeat us on the battlefield. So, it targets civilian infrastructure to try to freeze us into submission. Earlier today, just today, just Russia blew up a major dam located in Novokakhovka, causing significant civilian evacuations, harsh ecological damages, and threatening the safety of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Russia's actions are the actions of a terrorist state, an aggressor. Meanwhile, the Russian-installed governor of the Kherson region, Vladimir Saldo, blamed Ukraine for the attack on the dam. The reason for this behavior is simple. There is a saying in Ukraine, if I cannot eat something, I will at least bite it. Meaning, if we are unable to do something properly, we will play dirty tricks. And first of all, it is about creating a humanitarian crisis with food shortages. But you know what? We will never starve, because the whole of Russia is with us now. Another reason is to deflect attention from the horrible defeats that Ukraine faced during their counteroffensive yesterday. We go now to Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, where we're joined by Oleksiy Pasyuk, deputy director of the Ukrainian NGO EcoAction, where his focus is on energy and nuclear energy. Oleksiy, thanks so much for being with us. Um, it is not clear what happened at this point. What is clear is that there is major flooding and that there is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe located in Ukraine. Uh, the question is, uh, among other things, is that threatened? Can you talk about what you understand at this point and what you're most concerned about? Yeah, well, I, I will start that uh, it's pretty clear what happened. It's not very clear what are the consequences, but I find it uh, that you give too much space to Russian explanation of what is happening. Uh, it's, uh, it was reported already last year that Russians have prepared uh, mine, basically, the dam, because it was one of the scenarios of what you do. And there is a clear situation now with Ukraine uh, 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 kind of planning to start a military op operation to kick off Russians from the left bank of Dnieper River. And uh, one of the options which was on the table, which was discussed, is uh, Ukrainians crossing the river. So it's a kind of uh, obvious military solution to flood the area at this moment. Uh, now, um, as to the impact, obviously, the, the, the territory is flooded, and as uh, with any uh, similar, I mean, flooding, and especially of this scale, it's, you have uh, um, an uh, impact which can be caused by, like, uh, facilities which on the ground, which consider oily uh, materials, uh, I don't know, west. Uh, uh, storages, all that is basically now flooded, although they were not designed to uh, withstand it. Uh, 
Um, exactly as it was mentioned, there is an issue of immediate impact uh, of flooding now, but then the, the reservoir is also a source of water and there will be a major impact later through the year and the summer for the areas which use this water for um, agriculture, basically. Now, uh, the reservoir indeed uh, over the uh, dam um, is a source of water, and that's where the Parisian nuclear power plant uh, stays. But we have to understand that uh, there was part of this area which is uh, separated by the dam. So effectively, nuclear power plant has part of the reservoir which will not be immediately impacted uh, by the falling uh, water level because uh, it's uh, separated. Uh, uh, water um, pool and uh, also we have to recall that currently five of six units are in so-called uh, cold shutdown so they don't produce electricity and so the demand for cooling is lower however they have one unit uh, operational just to maintain electricity for supply for their own Needs. So there is, uh, as uh, International Atomic Energy Agency said, there is no uh, immediate threat because now they still have water and electricity. But the question is for how long they, they will be able to maintain it. Uh, so we face a future risk that uh, power plant would not have uh, enough water to cool down. And uh, it's not, uh, there is no obvious solution at this moment to understand how it will be solved. They would need to provide water at a certain moment. We don't know how much water will stay uh, uh, in the sense that we don't realize uh, yet how big is the damage to the, to the dam if there will some water stay in the reservoir. So, and uh, of course, uh, while technically there are possibility of solutions, it's all happening in the combat areas. So it's very difficult to repair. It's difficult, for example, to make evacuation at this moment because uh, the Russians are basically uh, shooting into the areas where evacuation is uh, happening. And also there this unexpected uh, for normal life um, impacts, like uh, you have some areas which were mined, and so now you have this mine basically taking over by water to the areas where they're not supposed to be. So this is obviously uh, a disaster in uh, in very different senses. And uh, Alexei, you mentioned that five of the six reactors have already been shut down, though they still need to be cooled to some degree. Uh, what are the prospects for that last reactor to be shut down, and why hasn't it happened so far? Well, this is, uh, I guess, a difficult choice now for people who maintain it, because uh, the power plant uh, for cooling, they need to have electricity, and uh, you have to have uh, external supply to the power plant, but we regularly saw this uh, news when this... Uh, um, lines were down, so there were no electricity. So they maintain. So for cooling, you need water and you need electricity to pump it. So once you stop this reactor, you also have higher risks that you would not be able to pump water even if you have it. Um, I guess this is a dilemma which uh, power plant station currently faces. And Alexei Pasyuk, um, who would this benefit the most? Um, Russia says this will hurt more the Russian side, and that is more proof, they say, that Ukraine did this. But then you have the Ukraine counteroffensive that is said would be thwarted by this kind of catastrophe. Can you talk about the situation and where we're actually talking about, how critical this area is at this point in the Ukraine war? Well, I, I think uh, Russians and this guy who you were uh, previously showing, who is a law occupation administration head, he have a difficult time to explain to the citizens why Russia, which is supposed to save them, flood them. Uh, for for Ukrainians, there is no reason to that. That's Ukrainian citizens, basically. We we uh, eager uh, the country to uh, to get them back. Uh, again, uh, there is an expectation of the military advance by um, uh, Ukrainian side. And uh, when you were saying uh, the dam is in the occupied territory, the dam is on the river, which currently separates two, uh, two sides. 
So Ukraine is planning offensive, and they were also planning to go across the river to the Russian control areas. And flooding, in this sense, is effective. I assume it was uh, blown up at this moment because uh, Russians assume that Ukrainians are ready to start um, uh, moving forward in that area. And uh, Alexei, we only have about a minute left, but I was wondering your sense of the the counteroffensive that uh, Ukraine has been uh, supposedly uh, launching in the last couple of days. Uh, what you're hearing uh, in Kiev about it? Well, I don't follow this military part, but I think it's uh, long expected. And I think the main message which we currently hear from the state is to be quiet about it, because if uh, so, there is very little information. And I think whoever would have it would not share it. Well, Alexei Pasyuk, we want to thank you for being with us, deputy director of the Ukrainian NGO EcoAction, where his focus is on energy and nuclear energy, joining us from the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. And that does it for our show. Following up on our previous discussion on Julian Assange, to see our interviews with Julian Assange when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy taking refuge and before that when he was free, go to democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermin Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warrenoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, and Sanji Lopez. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nogueira, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. If you'd like to sign up for our Daily Digest, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman in New York with Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Our website is democracynow.org. Thanks for joining us.